We should have recorded us talking about the Superman movies. I know. It sounds like that's something we could talk about for hours. <laughs> well, that's like our other podcast. For a lot of people, I feel like maybe this is one of the episodes you've been waiting for. Because today, we're joined by James Grime, the original Number file presenter. James fronted the very first video in our series, and he's been a mainstay of the channel ever since. But despite his bubbly personality and unquestionable passion for mathematics, well, I mean, James is a private guy. And that's what I think makes this episode a real treat, because James is really going to open up and tell us about what makes him tick, where he comes from, and maybe where he's going next. It was a chat that I really enjoyed, and I hope it's something you'll enjoy as well. You're like the number file original, aren't you? You were in the first number file video. Yeah, that's correct. You must have been in the most of anyone. I think I've been in the most of everyone, yeah. Do you feel like a warm attachment to the project then? Of course. I don't want to speak out of turn, but I feel I'm a founding member. Founding father. Yeah. Maybe this is over-emphasizing my influence, but I feel like we found the tone at the beginning. Yes. I mean, how do you make a maths YouTube channel? We were finding the tone. We went out into a field with a piece of brown paper. Yes, I remember. I remember we filmed like near an underpass tunnel with all graffiti because I originally imagined, in addition to the brown paper to make the videos feel all gritty, yeah. I wanted them to be in quite gritty locations as well. So we were all out all over the place filming and I sort of didn't end up doing that much anymore. Well, but... I, you told me this and I went, okay, I'm really not urban. I'm really not gritty at all. I think you're onto a wrong end there. So I think I was just too dorky to pretend to be cool and urban. I was right about the brown paper though. You were right about the brown paper. And I thought you were right about the brown paper. When you mentioned it to me, I said, good one. We went through all this together at the beginning, didn't we? The brown paper, all that. People ask why the brown paper all the time. Do you want to give the definitive answer? You've probably done this loads of times. There are multiple answers to why we write in number five videos on brown paper as opposed to white paper or a whiteboard or a blackboard. I did consider like buying slates and chalk, but the reason is, well, there are a few. One is it shows up better on film. Like it looks better filming the brown paper than white paper. I'm able to keep all the work afterwards. If it was on a whiteboard, it would all be erased and I want to be able to keep everything as an object but also as something I can refer back to. So I like that they're tangible objects. I like that it's like a physical object. It's unique and it's a bit gimmicky. You know, it's unique to the channel as opposed to the cliche of a whiteboard. It's a brand, isn't it? Yeah, it's like a brand. And it's more kind of sort of physical and people interact with the paper and... There's a big long shopping list of reasons, but... And I was all for it. I thought it was a a really good idea that you had. And people are disappointed when I don't turn up with brown paper, when I go and give talks. Where's the brown paper? Hopefully you have a few rolls in your backpack sometimes. Well, this is a number file brand thing. So maybe uh, with different hats on, I I do it in different ways and different styles. Yeah, yeah. Has it changed much from the start from your perspective? For people who don't know, which is every single person except you and me, we've just been recording for the last couple of hours here in my office. Is it different like today than it was all those years ago? Yes, I think definitely. I think when we started, the first idea, the original idea, which I still think is a good idea, is each video was about a number, wasn't it? It was riffing on your periodic videos and the 60 symbols. It's a hook to hang it on. I was all for that. So definitely even more so at the beginning, though. Today's number is whatever, 496, right? And then you talk about that. And then I always hoped and thought we would be able to branch away from that once we got established and we have done so we we kind of talk about maths generally now i also feel like the level has gone up as in complexity yeah i think the videos we do now are at a higher slightly higher level than the original videos i still like to throw in videos that hark back to the original ones i still do hey today we're doing the number such and such because i was there at the beginning i still kind of try and tie it back into those roots i do like to try and keep the levels different So when we come and film, I tend to do five in a row. Are we giving away secrets? No, no, no. That's what you like to do. Once you feel like you've got five you want to do, you'll jump on a train and come and visit me and we'll film together. Exactly. And it makes sense, doesn't it? So we do five in a row, but then I tend to break it up. I like to have a meaty one, a really good, proper, serious maths one. And then I throw in something slightly 
whimsical or something at a lower level. Partly it helps me because doing five heavy ones in a row is actually hard work. But also I think the channel should mix up the level. So James, I'd like to come back to Number File later because it is a big part of your life now making videos. So that's something we're obviously going to talk about. But before we get too lost in the weeds with the minutiae of the videos, I want to find out a little bit more about you and your background. So where are you from? <laughs> where did it all start? Where were you born? Uh, so I'm born in Nottingham, although my family are from Lancashire. So they moved to Nottingham. I was born in Nottingham. I lived in Nottingham until I was 17. Okay, so from naught to 17. What were you like? Were you like math nerd boy right from the start? What were you into like as a real youngster? No, not math nerd boy at all. In fact, no one really mentioned that I might be better than average at math. No one even mentioned it to me, so I, I didn't notice. And no one said a thing to me. What I was obsessed with was TV. I mean, I could dress that up as media or filmmaking, but that's, that's just dressing it up. I was obsessed with TV. I watched so much TV. Trashy junk stuff or wholesome, like, Attenborough documentaries or, like... Everything. I just watch everything. And then, consistently, when people ask me, what do you want to be when you grow up? My answer was, well, it was cameraman. Because, you know, about as a kid. <laughs> We've got it wrong, James, all this I know. time. I wanted your job. But I wanted to be... Probably more a director, I think. I probably wanted to be making the TV. Yeah. Really, I mean, that was my consistent answer for a very long time. You know, and that's still an interest of mine, which is why I'm interested in doing the YouTube stuff, because it's still there as an interest of mine. I feel like I get to do a bit of that as well, as well as with the math stuff. So even as a youngster, because like I imagine most kids get pretty obsessed with TV because kids just love TV, don't they? But were you already at an early stage thinking a step ahead and like behind the lens? Like how do they make that? No, or... I was analysing it. So obviously I have an analytical mind. I mean, I must do. Yeah. So I was very interested in the process of making the TV. I'm not saying I watched behind the scene documentaries or anything. I do now. I watch loads of those because <laughs> you just take what you're given on the TV. But I was very interested in how, you know, that person was placed there and that camera was placed there. And someone came up with that idea. Who came up with that idea to do that episode on that subject. That was very interesting to me. Do you remember which TV shows or movies or things like made the biggest impression of the many you watched probably? I've watched so much, but let's say, I mean, what turned out to have a big impression on me is the science programming, of course, in another way. So there's, on one hand, I'm watching TV thinking, how is it made? At the same time, I am watching the science programming and thinking, oh, that's a thing, is it? So when I said I was consistently telling people that I wanted to be a cameraman, in the back of my mind, I secretly was thinking, I know that a mathematician is a thing. I'm not going to tell anyone that I want to be a mathematician because they might ridicule me. That's beyond my station. So I went, hmm, I'll keep that in mind and I'll just keep working. Yeah, I don't want to have ambitions above my ability. Was there ability? Were you better at maths than the other kids in the class? Or did you feel better? Or did the I didn't feel better. I didn't know. Thinking back about it, so let's say at junior school, so you know, when I was 11 and under, probably was finishing a, a test sooner than other people. And I put my pen down and went, that's the test done, yeah. and waited for the other people. I didn't clock that that meant I was better at it than the other people. And teachers weren't saying, no. like, it wasn't in your report card, James has an aptitude for this. No. Do you put that down to some kind of humility of yours or do you put that down to the education system? Or I'm just totally unaware. I'm not, I guess, I'm not someone with a massive ego. I'm slightly concerned about talking about myself for an hour already. Hmm. I'm not someone with a massive ego. So no, no, it just didn't occur to me. It feels like a failure of the education system that they didn't identify no. someone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That they should have mentioned it because I, I genuinely didn't know. Maybe they should have mentioned it. I mean, there is, and we're talking about when I was under 11, there is the lovely story, though, which we did on number file with the little toy that I had. Do you remember the little professor toy? The, the calculator device. Mm, it's like a reverse calculator. It gave you problems and you had to answer them. All right, and I was good at that. The like worst calculator ever. <laughs> <laughs> the best calculator ever, yeah, yeah. I think you'll find. Okay. Oh, you know, and I was really good at that. And so I had that. And when other toys get thrown out, I still kept that. 
even when it was younger than my level, I kept that. And then when I got to a point where I said, I'm actually quite far along the road on this road of being a mathematician, I should really keep that toy now because that toy now is something that did help me along the way. So those devices, those professor calculators, for want of a better name, they look like a little man with a moustache and glasses, don't they, like the way they're yeah. designed. Do you look at that now and feel warm feelings? Like, you yeah, know, yeah. You're a mentor. <laughs> yeah, very much. Well, more than a teacher at the time, I suppose. I guess it shows I was, and still am, a very independent learner as well. So I'm afraid I wasn't taken by the hand by any figure. I was very much an independent learner, so I do these things at home for myself because, because I'm a curious person who likes to learn stuff. I wasn't necessarily a maths nerd or a science nerd. I was just, you know, oh, let's learn a thing. Oh, that's an interesting thing. I like curious facts. And I watched all the telly because I wanted to learn everything possible. I wanted to know as much as I could. So I watched all the telly, talking about figures who might have led me through my career, or led me to my career, it would be more like the science presenters on the telly rather than anyone in real life. What about like your family? Were they shoving math books in front of you or fostering that or were they just letting you get on with it? Like, Yeah, no, no, they weren't. I mean, they bought me the little professor. So they obviously thought, well, maybe we should be encouraging this, but not generally, no. So I don't come from an academic family to be an academic is not something that was expected in my family. I think my dad would be the first to go to university. Well, university means polytechnic. He did economics, I think. So two years or something like that. But not someone who's uncomfortable with numbers then? No, no, my dad's not daft. No, not at all. Oh, no, he's a good guy, my dad. But not an academic. My dad will never listen to this, so I can probably say <laughs> this. He has working class ideas of what your station is and not going above your station. Dad will not listen to this, so that's fine. All right. <laughs> okay, so he's like, he, well, that sounds very typical. English, humble, mustn't grumble, do your Whereas bit. Whereas I thought, well, can I go further than my dad? Bless him. My dad wanted me to go further than him. It's the same as he went further than his dad. Were there ever times where he would say to you then, don't do mathematics, James, you're not going to get like a good job out of that and do this? Or was he like, yeah, do what you want. I don't understand it, but do you do it? Well, he's very much of the, I don't understand what you're doing. He does have the opinion that the higher you're educated, the more money you should be making. And that turns out not to be the case. <laughs> <laughs> so as you're getting a bit older in your teens, it must be coming apparent now, oh, actually, I am pretty good at mathematics. And you start thinking, okay, I'm not going to be a cameraman, I'm going to be... A mathematician? When does that switch? Yeah, you're right. So I guess then at secondary school, so to add to my previous problems, my secondary school was rough. I went to a difficult secondary school. So I was a clever kid in a rough school. So, I mean, I was sat there and really 50 minutes of an hour lesson was telling people to shut up and sit down. And I was twiddling my thumbs, bored. I was really going out of my mind. Not the teacher's fault. But I'm afraid it was just a you know, kind of a rough area. Yeah. Were you able to stay out of trouble at least? Yeah, because I'm totally not that. And I had a very secure and happy family life, hmm. which might be not the case for the other people in the school. So I was lucky. I had a better foundation yeah. to work from. Yeah. But that was my experience. Quite frustrating because imagine how much I could have learned at school if school was able to teach me. So then that again goes to, fortunately, I am quite an independent learner. So I'm afraid I just had to do it myself. So what, you'd go home with the textbook and just like nut just it out? So? Yeah, just read it. Just read the textbook and then read books for myself and learn stuff for myself. I mean, my aunt used to get me encyclopedias. It's quite nice. Yeah, children encyclopedias, not like Britannica. Like a one volume encyclopedia. I used to sit and read it <laughs> through entry by entry. I used to sit and read that. Now, I did start to get encouraged by one of my teachers at secondary school, one of my maths teachers at secondary school. Who saw something in you? Or... He, he did recognise me as being the best one in the class. I, I don't want to say that. It sounds awful. So I guess he did recognise. And he, he said, you know, I can imagine James becoming an academic at a university. And I went, oh, well, that's one other person who thinks I can do that. Because at the moment, it was just a secret idea in the back of my head. No one else had said that before. Went, oh, well, that's two of us. And when we came to A-levels, so what you choose next when you're 17, 18, I wasn't going to do maths. 
because I thought, well, maths, it's going to get really, really complicated. It's going to be beyond me. It's going to be solving crazy problems with really hard maths, but I can't do it. I'm not going to do that. And this maths teacher said, you are doing maths. That was it. Do you remember the teacher's name? Yeah, Mr. Rossinger. Mr. Rossinger. He said, you're doing it whether you like yes. it or not. I might be wrong because I've got this secondhand knowledge. I think he went to South Africa in the end and not a teacher anymore or something like that. So this is the teacher that at least backed me up on, I was I, this is something I could do. And that's all it took. It just took one teacher saying, you can do it. And you're all right, then I'm applying. I'm doing it. That's, that's all it took. Yeah, well, it was one teacher saying, you're definitely taking maths. And I went along with it. What was plan B? What did you think you were going to do? So I did want to do media studies. Right. But uh, when I was 17, media studies was a punchline. People treated it as a joke. Oh, what are you going to do? Media studies as a non-real subject. And you can see why I wanted to do media studies. So I went, well, I don't want to be a joke. Uh, So I was discouraged from that. And I went, well, I'm going to go the complete opposite. I'm going to take the most academic thing to media studies, the complete reverse. Maths is the purest, most academic of the subjects. Where did you go? What university did you go to from there then? University, I went to Lancaster University. It makes me feel awful saying how great I am all the time. I did well. I did well. So I could have picked any subject. I have the luxury of picking any subject I wanted to because I was quite good. As in English or yes. mathematics? Okay. Yeah. What score did you get? Although I don't understand how A-level scores work. A-level scores? Well, A to F, isn't it? So it was A's, yes. Right. You got all the A's. What is it? These days, people try and get like three A's or A-stars and all these sort yeah, of things. Yeah. So they, they, since my time, they introduced A-stars and now it's new again because they've introduced numbers to it. It's not letter grades, it's number grades. Right. But you were getting all the A's. So you had some choices. How come you ended up at Lancaster? So the choice of Lancaster was because... We recently moved. So I was a Nottingham person. And then between GCSEs and A-levels, we moved to Lancaster. So I had already moved recently. I didn't want to move again. That's part of it. Okay. Lancaster's really nice as well. So we had a lovely day when we went to see it. And also maybe, so, okay, I've got three A's. Maybe that's grades that can take you to Cambridge and Oxford. But then I did not have the confidence to go to Cambridge and Oxford. I would have drowned in Cambridge and Oxford. I wasn't ready for that. Okay. I didn't have the confidence for it. I needed to be a big fish in a small pool. And that's what Lancaster did for me. And I'm very happy about that. That was what was right for me at the time. I did not have the confidence to go somewhere like Oxford and Cambridge. And Oxford and Cambridge is not everything. No. So the step up from high school level mathematics to university level mathematics as an undergraduate was that a big step or was that an easy transition? It's a step and it's a joy. I mean, it was a joy. So I've, I feel, first of all, the GCSE maths, I just felt it was so woolly. I thought, this is so trivial and so woolly. It was like, how do you tessellate a plane? It's like children's stuff. I thought, well, this is, I'm not interested in this. And then at A-levels, A-levels is very much learning algorithms and having an equation at the top and then getting an answer at the bottom. So it's very procedural. So A-levels is like the end of high school for people who don't know what A-levels are. It's like what you do to get into university. Yeah, so that's the end of school life. We've not got to like proof yet. Now, I went to university and I'm thinking, well, yeah, I'm taking maths because it's easy. I'm good at it. It's the lazy option. I'm, I'm a lazy person. However, thankfully, at university, we started doing things like proof. And I went, ah, good. Now this I can get on board with. This I'm interested in because that's a creative process. You see, now I don't want to feel like I'm doing down the education system or teachers or anything like that. But at least my A-levels felt very rote, rote learning. I learnt the algorithms and I could do them. There was no creativity. So I thought, it's this maths. I mean, this is simple. This is lazy because I just bang through these algorithms. There's no creative thought. What about my creative output? And I do feel that I had a creative output because I did want to be making film and televisions. And then, yes, great. University, now here's what a proof is. And it involves a creative idea. But it's other people's creative ideas. Yeah, the proofs you learn, but then you have the questions and you are doing questions where you are proving for yourself. That's the coursework, the homework. So you're in the lectures, you're teaching the traditional proofs, the famous proofs, the traditional proofs. You're learning the methods of proof. These are the classic methods of how to prove a thing. And then, you know, in the coursework, the homework, 
you're getting questions where you're doing it for yourself. And also, if it's good coursework, they're giving it a twist to see who's got some original thoughts, who can make some connections between two different things and put them together. You know, that's a, a creative twist there. And then, of course, you get to the point where you're actually doing an original result for yourself, which I guess is maybe when we're going into PhDs then beyond university maths. But then I do an original result that has never done before for myself that I solved proved to be true and is true forever. Do you remember a point at university where you thought, yes, this was the right decision? Like, thank goodness I did mathematics? Yeah, yeah, I think that's it. It's the point where, you know, we're going to do proofs and now here's your homework and it's proofs. And I sort of relaxed. I can even think about it now, okay, physically going, ah, oh, yeah, this is far more interesting. No, I can do this. Was this a surprise though? Like, did you know this was coming or did no, you sign on for mathematics? I think it was a surprise. I did think it was rote. Then why did you sign on for it? Just because Mr. Rossinger told you to. <laughs> yeah, laziness, total laziness. And that's not a good answer. I admit that's not a good answer. It's the true answer. However, I am very thankful that at university I discovered there was more to it. I would have been bored. If it was rote and I thought that was what was going to happen, I would have been bored. So as you move through, how long was your undergraduate course? Three years? It was a four-year one. I did an extra long one. And so as that was unfolding, what were your thoughts about your future and your future relationship with mathematics and career? Were you thinking, this is it, I'm here for life now? Or? Yeah, I guess that's where I was starting to think. Because that was that secret idea, wasn't there, in that back of my head. That was, I know it's kind of contradictory that I'm thinking, I seem to be bored by it because it's all rote. But also I know that mathematician is being a thing. I think I, maybe I like the kudos of it as well. So that's in the back of my head. Go, oh, okay, that's interesting. But were you thinking of, you know, if I do this right, I could go and work in the city of London and be a millionaire? Or were you thinking I want to be a math teacher? Or were you thinking I want to prove the Riemann hypothesis? It was academic. It was only academic, yeah. And then at university I saw that I was actually quite good at the actual proper maths, if I may call it that, the proper maths. It's a hurdle. Each time I was passing a hurdle, because I didn't tell anyone I wanted to do this, can I pass my GCSEs? That was my first hurdle. Oh, yes, I can. Next, can I do the next level? Oh, yes, I have passed that level. So each step was just, can I pass this hurdle? At university, what were you like as like a person? What were you into? Were you in a rock band? Did you play cricket? Were you in the chess club? What were you like socially? How were you developing like as a person? Well, I'm socially active. I suppose I had my probably unsurprising nerdy interest. My big interest was the juggling club. I'm a very good juggler, I have you know. Yeah. But I was the president of the juggling club. President of the juggling? Mr. President. Mr. President of the juggling club, which is something I did a couple of times. Two-term president. Well, I did it at Lancaster and then I did it at York, which is my next university. We'll get there. Juggling club, pretty social guy then. And well, part of that job is to be the social guy, to welcome people in. Now, it turned out this is something I could do. I discovered, it turns out I'm quite personable and, you know, can welcome people in, newcomers to the club. And then I would teach them the first few tricks. And, you know, so I'd be sort of teaching so people. So here's where we store the balls. Here are the clubs. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what it is. You know, do you want to learn how to ride a unicycle? Let me show you how the first few lessons of riding a unicycle. You will fall off. That's normal. So you know, we did all that. Who joins the juggling club? Who, what sort of, don't get me wrong, I'm not disparaging you. You know I love juggling too. I'm not as good like you, but I do enjoy juggling. But like, what kind of person is attracted to the juggling club? Because I know there's a lot of mathematics to juggling. You're right, you're right. The people who tended to be attracted to the juggling club fell in two camps, which were the nerdy science-y camp, computer scientists, physics, maths, nerds, and your hippies, your alternative counterculture hippie types. And do those two groups get along well? Yeah, of course. Right. Yeah. And isn't that wonderful? Isn't that nice uh, that those two groups who look different on the outside, because I can say that the nerdy kind of people maybe would be conservative of the small C, if you know what I mean, maybe a pair of jeans and a t-shirt, very yeah. conservative, and the you know, more grungy alternative people. So from the outside, they would look like different people, different worlds. We're brought together by the love of juggling. There you go. It just brings people together. How many people in the uh, Lancaster Juggling Club at, at peak? Is it like four or 400? 50 or so. Okay. Are you elected as president or are you? Yeah. Like, right. No, and it's not something that I seek. You were called to public service for juggling. Well, yeah. <laughs> 
because I, I'm not the kind of person who would put myself forward. I, I hope I've kind of been saying it in this podcast. I'm not someone who thinks I'm great. No, no, no. You're a very self-deprecating person, but someone has to be president. But it turned out I was the most sensible choice as being someone who knew everyone because I'm quite friendly and personable and would meet people anyway. So I was doing that and also sensible enough to actually run a society because jugglers are not necessarily sensible people, wacky, crazy people, not really people who can organize a group to do a thing when it needs to be done. Did you have a campaign slogan like make juggling great again? <laughs> No campaign slogan. I just seem to be the sensible choice. Do you know, weirdly, though, and it is weird, but that was actually a significant thing to me because it may, meant for the first time, because I'm not someone who seeks being put forward, for the first time I was put in charge of a thing. People listened to what I said. So I said, I think we should do this. And people went, yeah, okay. I went, oh, oh. I've never had people listen to what I said before. So that was actually... A big deal to me, putting myself forward in that way showed that it was something I could do. It turned out I could rise to the occasion so I could take that leadership role. I know it's just a juggling club, but it was the first time I ever tried to, to lead a thing. We would do shows because that's what a juggling club might do. And so I'm the president, I'm in charge. So I would have to be the compare. You know, I'm in charge of the show. Turned out I could do it. Was this also, do you think, a bit of an outlet for that media TV wannabe inside you well when i wanted to be media tv i never wanted to be the presenter so i always wanted to be the person behind the scenes never wanted to be the presenter so this is the first time where i said oh i can actually step in front it's like the drummer who becomes the lead singer and i can actually do it what did you like about it did you like hearing people laugh or getting a clap or just like i was amazed that i could do perhaps a joke or something and then produce a reaction from another person like those two things are connected and I did that that was new to me because I was very much wanted to be in the shadows so coming to the end of your Lancaster your undergraduate degree were you high in the class again you're getting quite strong marks yeah I was again a big fish in a small pool so what happens then what's the next step is this a point where you start seeing strengths and specializations or does that not happen at undergraduate level no you're right you're right so maybe third year is when you start specializing which means I started to specialize you could get to choose the courses because the first two years you just do the courses you're told to do so that you get a broad overview of everything and then yes you start to specialize you get to pick your courses so i was leaning towards uh, the pure maths which is actually the algebra it's called algebra which is not like school algebra it's not what is solved for x yeah yeah it's not solving equations i call it um chunky maths you're taking a step back from the math and you're seeing the mathematical object as one thing you've seen the whole thing you've seen the edges of it you've seen the whole object and then you take another chunky bit of math so you see another mathematical object and you're putting them together like lego and you're creating another thing so it's taking a step back where something like analysis is very much about the details so you're zooming in to the fine details the patterns that are in the fine details Whereas I, I preferred to take a, a step back. So coming to the end of your undergraduate, then you started getting a specialization. You're getting good marks. You're obviously still like, you know, very good at it. What are your options at this point? Are your options to go into the workforce yet or? Yeah, yeah, go into the workforce. I went for an internship at GCHQ. Ooh. So that's the government communication headquarters. Spies. Yeah, that's the spies. Yeah, the code breakers. So it was an internship. I mean, I was there with several people right but people you were put forward as one of the best in your university and then we all went and you got a, given a test what are you in like some secret bunker for it or? yeah we were at gchq which is now actually changed the building i went to is not the building that's gchq now oh the big posh round one the you big went. white donut building it wasn't that building right so it was whatever building it was before that and well i can tell you the story i mean i was sat there waiting for this interview. There's a sign on the wall that says status Black Eagle. I'm thinking, even the signs on the wall are in code. What does that mean? Yeah. Either I'm safe or I'm about to get bombed. It's one of the two. Not status sure. Status Black Eagle. Yeah. And then we were sent, oh, you have to go to this building. And then we as a group got lost. So we were wandering around GCHQ, the buildings of GCHQ completely lost. Said, Is this the first challenge to find the building? Anyway, so we, and then we, we had to take a test. And it was a maths and computer science. Now, I'm not into computer science. 
So I'm afraid there's nothing I could do on that part of the test. You know, and I had a crack at the math. And it was stuff that I hadn't seen before. It was quite difficult on test conditions, you know, things you'd never seen before, unconnected to what you might have done as an undergraduate, really testing uh, your mathematical abilities or creative abilities. I'm afraid I didn't get that internship. Did you know you did the test? Did you think I've bombed here? Or I didn't know, but obviously there was a whole section I couldn't do because it was about computer science. And so maybe that was important to them. Did they interview you as well? Was there a person? No, there wasn't. It wasn't an interview like that. Did you ever find out what status Black Eagle meant? We weren't bombed. So I assumed <laughs> everything was fine. But that was my first taste of failure, actually. Did you feel like a failure, did you? Yeah, that was the first test I'd ever failed. I have a work ethic. I, I'm not a genius, but I have a work ethic. Quietly, I was bashing through these hurdles that I have to bash through and I always did and then that was my first test I've ever failed. How did that affect you? Did it you know make you stronger or did it crush you for a while? Or? That was a new experience to me yeah and again I never I've never thought I am the big I am but that was a new experience. I did have a, um, a crisis of confidence yeah I went oh maybe I'm not the best. So this is towards the end of your degree. Yeah. You're not going to be a spy or a code breaker by the looks of it. What do you do now? What's next? This was going to be something that would have been in between university and then PhDs. That's what it would have been. So you decided you were going to do a PhD. So I was already on the road to PhD anyway. So I did my PhD at York University. Lancaster and York traditionally have a um, rivalry, but pff, who cares about that? Well, a load of old nonsense. So I went to York University. Yeah, I started my PhD, where the other PhD students are all the best at their university. So suddenly you discover, oh, I'm now amongst other people who were also the best at their university. I'm not so special after all. What was your PhD in? We can start with group theory, which is maths of symmetry. Symmetry of shapes, but in maths, symmetry means there's something that you care about that you want to stay the same. So it might be shape, volume, angle, magnitude, something that you care about, you want to stay the same, and then you want to mess around with it in other ways, but you want that particular property to stay the same. That's symmetry. So for a shape, you can rotate a shape keep the same shape, it doesn't bend or anything, but you can rotate it. So that's symmetry in math. So that's group theory. And then representation theory, which is what I was doing, is a bridge from this abstract maths of weird symbols and wibbly wobbly maths to a more concrete world of matrices, which is what you would use in computer science and what engineers would use. So a matrix would be an array of numbers and that's very well understood well-studied, concrete thing. But there is a connection between those two worlds, between this weird abstract world and this very concrete world. Now, how do you make that bridge? So, well, there are ways to make that bridge that involve more maths and formulas and wibbly-wobbly stuff. And I prefer to do it with pictures, which is more combinatorial, combinatorial representation theory. By using pictures, which by using pictures makes the maths easier to understand, where so you don't have to get lost in the uh, Greek letters. So using pictures, you can make that bridge between those two worlds. But it's a very pure maths thing to do. Who was your PhD supervisor? Because I know that's a big deal in mathematics, you know, this sort of who's your supervisor and your supervisor's supervisor and the family that, trees. Yeah, and... the genealogy of yeah. it. My supervisor was Maxim Nazarov, a Russian mathematician. So my genealogy is a whole bunch of Russian mathematicians. What was it like being surrounded by all these other math geniuses? Like you said, for the first time, you weren't necessarily the smartest guy in the room. Was that good for you or bad for you? It made me realise that... I had to use my other strengths as well. And I do have other strengths, not just being good at maths. So you know, being quite personable and I like to think I can teach things and you know, explain things. And So I started to think, okay, I do want to go into maths, but also I have skills that perhaps some of these other people don't have. So it's hard to compare yourself especially if there are people who are doing really, really well. But you have to remind yourself that you have other skills. What was the title of your PhD thesis, do you remember? I almost can't remember. I think I can remember. So it was uh, the Hook Fusion Procedure and Generalizations. Are you proud of it? Is it a good one? Well, the best work in it I actually did in my first year of my PhD. So I started off thinking, hey, I'm doing really well because I've already got some good results and that's going into the final product. Bang, done. I must be really good at PhDing. And then the next two or three years was more of a slog. It was harder. So yeah, I mean, it's amazing to have your 
own results and you proved a thing. But also there's work in there that I, you know, I nearly completed, but there was like a step that I just this close to it and then I didn't complete that step. So the work is in there, but it kind of feels like incomplete work. So I got this far. So this is only a conjecture because this is the sticking point that I couldn't prove. If anyone proves that step, then that's now a theorem. So there's some bits of it that look like that. So you were telling me about the, the young James in Nottingham, understanding that being a mathematician was a thing. It was possible. Now you're doing a PhD, you're spending all your time with high-level mathematicians doing high-level mathematics. How was the reality of mathematics and mathematicians different from what the little boy imagined? <laughs> it's hard work. PhD is hard work. It's very frustrating. If you talk to PhD students, they have this kind of grey pallor to them. They start off all enthusiastic and then the second year they realise, oh, actually I better crack down on this because I better have something to finish with it. And then by the time of the third year, they've learned that if you die during the course of a PhD, you automatically get your doctorate. And they start to consider that as an actual option. <laughs> Is that? I didn't even know that was. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's one of the maybe the myths that I've heard about PhDs <laughs> that I was hanging on to. Because <laughs> it doesn't sound like something that is true. But I thought, I hope that's true, because that could be my only option at this point. It does sound unfair to say to a young person, basically lock yourself in a room for three years and have an important original idea that hundreds of thousands of geniuses before you haven't had. Yeah, that does sound hard, doesn't it? So I think there are things that maybe I should have known. I shouldn't have been as hard on myself as I was then. So I was very much obsessed. So you'd be waking up in the middle of the night and you're always thinking about the problem. And that's the strain to be always thinking about your mathematical problem and more of a strain than it might be for other subjects. So if you were doing some other, an experimental science or something, at least you have days off where you're doing your experiments, you're planning your experiments, and then you do your experiments. In maths, it's all brain work all the time. And I was very hard on myself when, you know, you have a day when you achieve nothing. And oh, you know, I'm terrible, I'm rubbish. That's really hard. What maybe I should have been told is that's an unreasonable expectation to be all maths all the time, especially in a subject like maths. I should be two hours in the morning, two hours in the afternoon, right? And, you know, have it treated as a job and then, you know, have a chill out time. Were you still doing juggling and watching yeah, TV oh, shows? Oh, yeah. Or? I mean, I was very social, yeah. So my undergraduate, I was much better with a, a much better work ethic, which was, you know, I would work and then I would finish at six and then... That's the end of working at six, and then I'll do my social things. Mm. And then at the weekends, I'd write up my notes for the week, and then they would become revision notes for the future. It was very good work ethic. My PhD, I was more of a student in my PhD than I was in my undergraduate. There was less structure to my day. So I'm, I'm afraid I kind of lost the structure. I would normally impose on myself. I'm not that kind of person typically. The lines between work and not work became blurred. You did finish your PhD, though. Yes. You became Dr. Grime. Yes. Now what do you do? <laughs> yeah, good question. What I did is I did do um, a postdoc, so I went into academia. I did academic work. Where did you do that? That was at York to start with. I did do a little thing in Denmark as well. But it wasn't even a year. It was less than a year. But I did something at Norhus in Denmark, then came back and did something in York. But then I was thinking, I want to earn my stripes. I want to do a few years of this kind of academic work. But the stuff we're doing now was where I was heading. I was thinking, this is where I'm heading. As in like outreach yeah. and communication. Yeah. I thought I was going to get a few more stripes, a few more years, and then absolutely just start to do more of this outreachy stuff. Yeah. There, but and I, and I was, because, because I was thinking, do I want to spend the next 40 years of my life becoming an expert in one really small part of maths? And the answer was no, I didn't. That did not interest me. I quite like having a very broad knowledge. I mean, I guess you can see that from the things I was talking about as a kid, you know, facts, give me facts. I wasn't particularly the maths guy. You'd like to be a, a gym of all trades and yes. a master of none. <laughs> and I'm afraid that's the case. So yeah, very interested in lots of things and maths is a very broad subject too so even if you're talking about maths maths is a broad subject and I was pretty much good at all of it but going deep 
just in one part of it, uh, that didn't appeal to me. So something like what I do now, though, is what I was heading towards anyway, where I get to learn lots of things at a certain depth. It's not shallow, but I'm not the world expert at anything in particular. But sometimes, you know, when you and I are talking or making videos, you'll tell me about this extraordinary proof or a breakthrough or something amazing that a mathematician did. And I can tell from your enthusiasm that you're impressed by what they did and the impact they had and what a wonderful contribution they've made to mathematics. Don't you ever wish you were that man or woman who'd done that rather than just being the person telling the story? The cheerleader, yeah, yeah which is how I feel. I feel like more of a cheerleader. I mean, I guess I would, but that involves giving up what I've created for myself now. I'm very happy with what I've created for myself now. So would I do anything different? No, no, I'm where I wanted to be. That is fine. I am where I was heading. So how did you get from being a postdoc at a couple of different institutions to an outreach dude. What happened next? Always this idea in the back of my head, you know, being a mathematician. But also, I mean, I was inspired by, if anyone, by these presenters on children's TV. And I was at a school where I was a clever kid in a rough school. And I wanted to pay that forwards. So that was always the ambition, to pay that forwards, to do something like what those presenters did for me. At that point, though, I'm assuming, you know, there's probably not, YouTube's not a big thing or anything like that. No. How are you thinking you'll do it? You'll apply to the BBC to present their next TV yeah, show. Yeah, exactly. So I was thinking, earn my stripes so that I have some qualifications to, to show off. Credibility. Credibility. And maybe then in future I could do a BBC documentary. And that's exactly what I was wanted to do. That was exactly the idea. And then YouTube was invented in, what, 2005? I went... Here's an opportunity for me to practice. I mean, I didn't know this is the new media. and Now you and me know. <laughs> this is the new media, right? Yeah. But this was an opportunity for me to practice doing that. And that's what I did. So I started a YouTube channel and I started to practice how to present mathematical stuff. What were you doing? Just putting like a camera on a tripod and standing in front of it and... Yeah, which is still what I do now, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, that's my Singing Banana channel, which is where I started. This is your personal YouTube channel still to this day where you upload yes. videos yes. and talk about mathematics. Exactly. Why is it called Singing Banana? <laughs> why, is it, why not? It's a bit perfectly sensible. That's an unacceptable answer. <laughs> so Singing Banana was my internet name, just generally anyway. So as a teenager or someone in their early 20s, and in the early days of the internet, you would have an internet name, wouldn't you? You would have a handle, anonymous internet name and singing banana was my internet name it came from my school's tuck shop my school sweet shop right it was called the singing banana which in turn came from an advert for yogurt that was on tv at the time okay so there was an ad for yogurt that had a singing banana they named the tuck shop at your school singing banana and then when you were sitting at a computer and had to come up with a handle that's just what you pulled out of the air. On the internet, when you sign up for new things, that's just the thing, my anonymous name on the internet. Isn't that funny that your school, which you don't speak about with lots and lots of affection, mm. still has a pretty big impact on you? <laughs> yeah. Oh, great. Yeah, well, yeah, it's a funny name, isn't it? It's a funny name. So you start the Singing Banana YouTube channel. You're making videos, but that's obviously not making you a whole lot of money or anything, obviously. It's making me zero money. I've made zero money from my Singing Banana channel. So what are you doing career-wise or work-wise while you're making these videos? So that's still when I'm doing postdocs. I'm still in academia there. Yeah. So I'm in academia and I'm thinking I want to do this communication stuff. I'll tell you what actually happened then. <laughs> Just when I finished my PhD, so this would be 2006, the Royal Institution advertised a job. Now, the Royal Institution of Great Britain, they have this program called the Christmas Lectures for people who are not from the UK, which are lectures for children on Christmas week about science. Very famous, very like, iconic, in an institution in a the UK. A big deal. I mean, that's part of the influence on me as well, because this is, oh, this is a scientist talking about science for kids. And they'd film them and they'd be on the TV and yeah. they'd have like, like the blue thing chemicals up or show you amazing things. Yeah, and, and it's a great thing. It's mm. great. Something that I do think is great and something that influenced me. Uh, so anyway, this was the year for maths. They were going to do a maths one yeah. this year with Marcus de Soitoy. And so they needed someone to be the assistant, help work on the scripts, liaise with Channel 5, it was then, it's gone back to the BBC now, but it was Channel 5 for a period, and liaise with Royal Institution. And I thought, this is a job for me. 
these are my skills because I'm interested in media. I'm interested in maths. I'm interested in communicating maths. This kind of presenting for kids is exactly the stuff I need. This would be a great experience for me. So I had an interview for that with Marcus and the Royal Institution. People. Tell me you walked in and it said like Operation Black Eagle on there. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. You yeah, knew that exactly. was a bad sign. <laughs> and then, well, we had a great interview. Me and Marcus were getting on like a house on fire. And because I was the last in the day, because I went, I traveled the furthest. So they put me last. Because I was last, I had all the time I needed. So I was just going, and then we could do this, and then we could do this, and then we could do this. And I didn't get that job. I've talked to Marcus since about this. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I did not get that job. And I thought that interview went so well. And I was so energized for the first time because, you know, PhD is hard work. And then I was so energized by this idea. I went, well, clearly this is what I should be doing because I haven't been this enthusiastic for a couple of years because I've been kind of stressed out. Well, yes, I should be doing it. And then that's when I had this plan of having earned some stripes and then really do this. And when I started doing YouTube so that in future I couldn't be turned down. I thought maybe they turned me down because I didn't have enough media experience. I need to make a CV that can't be turned down next time this comes up. And that's what I did. So I started making YouTube. It was partly practice for me. It was partly to have it on my CV. You can see who I am. You see what I do. I started doing outreach work for the university. I started, you know, trying to put myself as the friendly face of the university, trying to put myself in that position so I could have a CV that can't be turned down. So then my postdoc was running out, as postdocs do, I'm afraid. So I had, then had to go looking for another job. And then a, a friend of mine sent me a, a job advert and said, that's you, isn't it? I went, yeah, that is me. Because basically what I had been preparing myself for. It wasn't with the Royal Institution, it was with Cambridge. And they needed someone to work publicly, to talk. And I thought, well, this is ahead of schedule. Because my schedule was to do a bit more academia and then do and then do that. But I'll go, actually, I wanted to go for the practice of the interview. I thought I wasn't going to get it because I didn't get the other one, the Royal Institution one. This was, again, just practice for the interview so that I can do this right. And what was the job, though, just to be like an outreach person, to go yeah. and give lectures or something or yeah, go to that's schools? Right. And... That's right, yeah. Public and maths communication, public stuff, yeah. But in particular, they had uh, an Enigma machine that was on loan to the maths department. And so the job was, who wants to show this Enigma machine off around the world? This is the machine the Germans were using to send codes and was later broken. So that was going to be like a prop that you could go and travel around with and do exactly. math talks. Okay. Exactly, yes. So you went to the interview thinking, well, I'm not going to get my hands on the Enigma, but you did. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Did you walk out of that interview thinking you'd aced it? No. That's the secret, James. It's always the interviews you think you're bomb that you end up getting. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I thought because I didn't get that other one, I thought, yeah, I did this one perfectly fine. I thought I wouldn't get that one. I can't see any difference between how I performed in what this interview and that interview. And then like 10 minutes later, because I think, again, I was near the end of the day. 10 minutes later, they phoned me up and offered me the job. I was still stood at the bus stop. <laughs> Brilliant. Did you walk back and sign the papers? That's I've, I've never heard of someone hearing that quick. I heard afterwards that they thought, because I was the second to last interview, and then the, the person who was the last interview, they went in. They called during that interview halfway through. <laughs> Wouldn't that be awful? He came out, this is terrible, he came out looking slightly grey. Oh dear. But I was still there because it was raining. Okay. It was chucking it down. They thought I was hanging around for an answer. Ah. Like I was some sort of weirdo hanging around for an answer. I wasn't hanging around for an answer. It was raining. They thought you were a weirdo, but they still gave you the job. Yeah. <laughs> he seems to be very keen to find out. Oh, tell him now. Uh, I wasn't. I was just waiting it to stop raining. So I was, you know, waiting at the bus stop in the rain. That's when they phoned. I, so I didn't take it because I was getting on the bus. You know, I got, I got this job and that was a big deal to me. Yeah. Did you enjoy that? Did, were you like, it was my dream job. I mean, I'm still doing it. I'm still doing it, pretty much. Not for Cambridge anymore, but like, yeah. No, not for Cambridge, but basically I'm still doing the same sort of thing. Uh, I travel the world, I give talks, and of course I can do other things on the side, like our number file. Well, let's explain that, because I guess a lot of people listening to this will just know you as the guy who's in lots of number file videos. Explain to people this other job you have, your day job, your actual job, <laughs> how you actually eat. Yeah, 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 pays the rent. So I travel the world, travel the UK mostly and travel the world, giving talks 
often about Enigma and I still have the Enigma machine on loan to me. So it's, instead of being loaned to the university, it's on loan to me now. Yeah. And I give talks about how the code was broken and Alan Turing. And it, it's about motivating. It's about inspiring. People. Who do you who do you give these talks to? So often I'm talking to teenagers or kids. I go all levels and I enjoy going through all levels. Mm. This is part of the reason why I enjoy the job so much. I talk to small kids, 10-year-olds, 9-year-olds, that kind of age. And then I'll talk to teenagers and then the higher end of that, so the 18-year-old universities. I'll talk at universities. I talk to mathematicians. I will talk to the general public. So pretty much any level. So what happens? Do people like go to a website, do they, and book you and like, and you come out and... Yeah, that's it. I was very lucky because I inherited something from Cambridge. So that was all kind of set up for me because I was inheriting something. And then when I inherited it, I said, oh, I could really make this mine. I think more so than my predecessors who kind of came into the job and out of the job. No, this is a job that I can make mine. Because this is right in my wheelhouse. I already had that, so I didn't like have to chase it. And so word of mouth is actually how most of my bookings happen. I'm not very good at self-promotion. I now on a podcast self-promoting it. No, I'll promote it for you. There'll be a link to James's website in the notes to this podcast. And if you know someone who wants to have a great talk about mathematics and the Enigma machine, you go go ahead and click on that. Presumably you have to carry this great big yeah. heavy machine all around the world. Yeah, I do. What happens when you go through like customs at countries and you've got this Nazi code machine? I tell them it's a typewriter. So it looks like a typewriter and telling them it's a code machine just sounds dodgy. Yeah. So I tell them it's an old fashioned typewriter. Has anyone ever said, no, it's not, that's an Enigma machine. So what happened sometime last year, and I even forget where I was, but at some airport and I was doing this. Now, normally that just goes through. They go, oh, typewriter, old fashioned, that's a weird thing to be carrying, but okay. Now they're too busy to really investigate that any further. Now there's nothing illegal about what I'm taking through. So there's nothing wrong with this. Yeah, they send it through the scanner, right? It looks like an old typewriter. But yeah, there was an occasion like last year where and I went, oh, oh an old fashioned typewriter. Right, like, okay, we'll send it through. And then he shouted to the person at the other end, at the other end of the scanner, we've got an old typewriter coming through. It looks like an Enigma machine, but it isn't. Oh, don't shout that out. What did you say? Did you say, it is? <laughs> no, I was just, oh, it's just that a whole airport can hear this. It's not like someone's going to steal it. Well, I wouldn't want to give people the uh, opportunity. Yeah, it looks like luggage. It just looks like luggage. But maybe I'm giving away secrets. Okay, we've said enough. We should point out, though, it does work. It's not like just well, a relic you look we, at. This we brought is... it on to number five. I should mention it belongs to Simon Singh. So it's his personal Enigma machine that he lends to me. You've had it for a long time now. Does he? Does Simon ever ring you up and say, can I see my machine? <laughs> Occasionally, but I, actually hardly ever. Uh, I have been looking after it for a long time. I have to be very careful not to say my Enigma machine to remind myself because I've been looking after it for so long. I have to remind myself it's not my Enigma machine. <laughs> It's Simon's, but he's been very generous with it. Yeah, because uh, he wants it to be shown off and used for educational reasons. We are in agreement on that, so we, uh, I, I do it on his behalf. Do you ever get sick of giving the same talks and telling the same stories, though? So what's different for me, what I'm doing, is yes, my talk is, they say, the same or, you know, same-ish or you know, on the same topic, you know, relatively the same. But what I've got every day is I'm talking to a different audience different age group in a different town, sometimes in a different country, different ability levels. I'm working really hard. The only thing that's actually constant for me is the actual talk. And now I'm sure every job involves some sort of repetition. Every job involves going to a place and doing the same sort of things every day. I don't feel too bad about that. The only thing that is constant for me is I'm talking about a particular topic. I do talk about other things. I should say I do talk about other things. And number file is very nice for me because I get to talk about other things via number file. Right? So I don't get too bored. But all those other factors means that I'm actually working very hard. I'm looking at my audience. I'm trying to keep them on board. I'm trying to judge their level. I'm trying to judge if they're going to go with me if I go this far. Under the surface, I'm paddling. We're getting close to number file again, clearly at this point. A lot of people will probably want to know how 
you became involved in the project as a founding father. Mm-hmm. Buckles on my hat, yeah. uh, buckles on my shoes. I will be curious to hear how you tell the story because I, I've, I work on a few YouTube channels and I've been sitting in the audience before with some of my other collaborators, like on periodic videos. I was once sitting in an audience where, and Professor Polyakov told the story of how he and I started making the periodic videos project. And I couldn't believe the story he told. <laughs> Afterwards, I said, that is very different from my recollection. And he has adapted his story since. So I would like to hear how you tell it. This is interesting because I was going to ask you the exact same question. <laughs> I was very interested in how you tell this story as well, whether it was different to my version of this. Who's going to go first? Well, you, it feels like you should. You're okay, the best. I'll go first. Right. So my version, I was doing my singing banana videos. In my memory, I was doing like one a week. Looking back, I was doing like five a year. And that's not how I remembered it. I think I did go up to one a week at some point. Right. So I was doing these singing banana videos, trying to present maths. And that was before periodic videos in my memory. So periodic videos came along. This is the series of chemistry videos. Your chemistry channel. Yeah. Yeah. And I said, what a wonderful chemistry channel. What a lovely thing. Wouldn't it be nice if there's something like that for maths? I was actually trying to push that in Cambridge. I was trying to say to people in Cambridge, you see what that guy's doing with periodic videos? We should be doing that with maths. Why were you going to Cambridge and saying that? Weren't you just thinking, well, I'm doing that. I'm doing because I thought we could do that with all those lecturers in the Cambridge University resources that we have. Yeah, you wanted the famous professors to be fronting. I was it. still. Oh, I wasn't presenting. I was still the back. I was still organising. I was the back stage of this. Oh, I still wasn't putting myself forwards. No, the idea was to do periodic videos with all these clever yeah. Cambridge people. So yeah. yeah, Cambridge shrugged. I'm glad you didn't get that off the ground. You were scup at number five before it even started. But then I tried, I said to Cambridge, look, it's easy. And then I was doing more singing banana. It's videos. not easy. <laughs> look, look, how, look, I can do it on my own. Here's me just doing it on my own. Yeah, yeah. Imagine what I could do if I had the power of you behind Imagine me. Imagine if you gave me a filmmaker and worked with me. Yeah. So I was doing more singing, but trying to prove to them that this is a thing that could be done. And then I think there was a video... You did on periodic videos about ice, something like that. And then I riffed off that. In the old days of YouTube, YouTube had reply videos, which I miss as a feature. Do you remember reply yeah, videos? Yeah, I'd forgotten about that. I missed that. That was a good feature that they mm. took away. Mm. It was more of a social network then. It wasn't just broadcasting. It was a conversation. You would reply with a video and reply with a video. I missed that feature. And I replied to your ice video saying, well, and, and, you know, snowflakes are always hexagons. They're always six-pointed hexagons because ice molecules make, whatever, 120 degrees, and then they must fit together to make hexagons. So you might have noticed that. I don't know. And also, the other thing is you had another channel called Bible Decks. Yes. And I may have been the only fan of Bible Decks. Ugh. <laughs> well, I don't there know. a few others. <laughs> it, it, that was a video about every book of the Bible. It was quite an academic channel as well, professors talking about them. And... But I, that was the feeling I was getting from you because I was sending you, maybe I was sending you tweets or something, mm. right, saying, love your Bible decks because I'm not religious. I'm not necessarily, I don't know this stuff. Mm. See, I always want to learn. I'm always interested in your chemistry videos, your physics videos, I kind of know it because I'm in the science world. That's not outrageously new to me. The Bible stuff, all new. No, don't know it. Love it. Thanks for the videos, Brady. So I think maybe you noticed who I like. And then I did say, if you ever do a maths channel, ask me and I might be able to help. I think that's what I said. And I wasn't. Maybe if I say this now, you might not realise I wasn't putting myself forward as a presenter. I was putting myself forward as a helper, resource. Yeah, producer. Yeah. And then you did contact me, didn't you? We got that Google money. Because yeah. yeah. Google started to try and put out some channels of their own. There was a bit of um, a sponsorship or something, whatever yeah. you call it, a grant. Yeah. And then you did contact me. I mean, yeah, that's not, you're not far wrong there. That's. A, I mean, from my end, I was making a few different YouTube channels, periodic videos, Bible decks, ones you mentioned, 60 symbols and a few others. YouTube approached me and had grants available to start new channels. And they said to me, if you were going to start a new educational channel, what would you do? And I said to them, oh, I've got two ideas. I'd want to make an astronomy one, which became my Deep Sky Videos channel. And I said I'd want to have a mathematics one. And my idea to do it was to do it was number file, make it about numbers so it was less intimidating and not straight away math, math, math. And they agreed they were good ideas. But to my surprise, they funded both. So I had a grant and now I was like, oh, God, I've got to make these videos. And that basically coincided with the time that you just happened to get in touch as a viewer and said, hey, I like what you're doing. I'm interested. 
this is what I'm doing if you ever want to work together. And like, I probably get a lot of messages like that still to this day and nine times out of ten I can't do anything about it. They just kind of drift past and I say thanks for the offer but I'm really busy. But you just came along at that perfect time when I needed someone who knew mathematics and knew communication and video mm. and like I basically snatched you, snatched yeah. you up while I think I, could. I had the feeling you snatched me up. Yeah, yeah. I think – we had that first conversation about it and I thought I had a few like maybe ideas, which probably turned out to be the first few videos. I think the one that might have turned you was the amicable numbers. I told you about amicable numbers, that first meeting, yeah, which is the, was it 284 and 220? I remember. I remember like, because those stories about just arbitrary numbers that have interesting properties, like still give me chills. Still sometimes now if we're filming mm. and you show me just some random fact about a number, I still get chills <laughs> down my spine Well, it's that, a random way more fact about a number, but there's a, lovely, there's a lovely twist to it because so the, the 220, 284 is the factors of one number adds up to the other number. So the factors of 220 add up to 284. Factors of 284 add up to 220. They come as a pair. And in ancient times, they would represent love. So it's not just a fact about a number. It's more than that. Something cultural as well. There's a human story to that. There's a twist to that. So obviously... Some number file videos, in fact, lots of your number file videos have become very, very popular. They've been watched millions and millions of times. That's like great because that's always what we wanted to do. But I guess that doesn't come without problems and negative sides as well. There's the notorious YouTube comments. There's the fear of getting things wrong on the internet, which is a fear that lives with everyone who makes things on the internet. How have you found coming to grips with that as you become better and better known and more and more people are watching? And also the internet becomes a more crazy place. Do you read comments? I read comments on Singing Banana. I used to read them on Numberphile in the early days. Then Numberphile became too popular. You're still very loved, James. You must read them sometimes. I, I'm afraid I haven't read them. And also, if I dismiss the nasty comments by the same token, I have to dismiss the generous comments. What about the stuff that's like mathematical, though? People who want mm, to discuss with I would you. love to, but I can't wade through all those other comments to get there. The Singing Banana, I do read all the comments on Singing Banana. And so it's very likely that I will engage with you <laughs> via the Singing Banana uh, comments section. I want to say, hey, I grew a thick skin. That's not true. Comments, nasty comments, get under my skin. It's not nice. How could it be? I'm not superhuman. They're not nice at all. There are some comments you could dismiss in the early days of YouTube. Gay first fake right you say, oh, it's 12 years that's so easy to dismiss though and then there are comments that aren't that just you know comments that attack my presentational skills or my mathematical ability are actually personal attacks yeah <laughs> that's not nice is it no. the only reason i'm here is because i'm supposed to have mathematical skills and presentational skills so you've just attacked the exact thing i'm interested in providing and that's not nice so i'm afraid i can't claim to have a thick skin about that what are some of the nice things about doing it, though? You keep doing it, so there must be yeah, some positives. Because I'm on a mission. I didn't really fall into it. I didn't put myself forward for things. I think I said that. But it's not like I fell into it by accident. When opportunities arose, I took the opportunities very quickly because I knew that this is what I wanted to do. You know, If there was something like number file come along or my job at Cambridge came along or you know, when YouTube just by existing, had gave me an opportunity. Yes, I took those opportunities. So I am on a mission. I want, as someone who came as a clever kid from a rough school, I want to find those little James Grimes who don't come from academic families, who are in a rough area, who have not been exposed to this academic world, because that's exactly what my childhood was. But through TV and children presenters, those programs, I discovered that that was the thing you could do and it was an idea in my head. A seed was planted and that's what I'm trying to do. And I can do it. And it's amazing. YouTube allows me to do that. And it allows me to do that around the world. So I get emails from around the world, people saying thank you for the videos, which is lovely and meaningful. I reply to those emails as well. You know, my reply is thank you. This means a lot to me. And that might just sound like what you write in an email. Um, those are very meaningful emails to me. So I appreciate them. Do you feel like you're 
reaching the right people? You know, you said you want to reach people who are disadvantaged and that. Mm. Do you ever worry that you're preaching to the choir and the people watching are already the smart kids who are into no, I don't, math? I don't feel that's what number file is, or singing banana. I don't feel that's what it is. It's because I think, and it all, it all hangs on YouTube's favour, but you stumble across YouTube videos, don't you? You go, oh, what's this in my recommendations? Mm, click. Now, you're at home. You've no peer pressure. You're not being watched by your mates. They're not judging you. You can sit and click that and watch it with no pressure at all in your bedroom. I imagine I'm talking to someone, so maybe you know, a teenager who's watching that video by themselves outside of school. This is not something that a teacher has made them watch. They found it for themselves. They discovered it for themselves. So therefore, they're already engaged in it because they kind of discovered it for themselves. And then from that, you click on the other videos that's made, that comes up in the recommendations. If you like it, if you like it. If you don't like it, fine. No pressure. I'm not trying to force anything on you. But it's so minimum pressure that, you know, you just discover it. You try it. Try another one. Try the next one. I think we do reach those people who would not otherwise have been exposed to that kind of academic idea. Do you meet people, you know, starting out at university who say that it had made a difference? Yes. Because I, I meet that a lot. <laughs> okay, then yes. <laughs> so, yeah, I do get emails, first of all. And they, you know, they come in drips and they're charming, all of them. Now, because we've been doing it for seven years, haven't we? Now I get people at a university talk or something like that who will come to me at the end of a university talk and say, actually, I chose to do maths at university because of your videos on Numberphile. And I feel like, oh, geez, I can't take the responsibility for your life choices. Don't put that on me. Um, but I mean, wonderful. That was the intention. So that, thank you very much. Do you ever get recognised just walking down the street or at a restaurant? Yes. You sort of say that you're quite personable and outgoing and you are very charming and nice. But you also seem like a guy who likes your own space. And yeah. when you're not performing, you seem more withdrawn. I, I find it hard to imagine how you'd react to strangers coming up to you and saying, oh, it's James Grime. So yeah, it does happen regularly. Yeah, it happens. And... <laughs> when it first started to happen, I did not react very well to it. I did not go, why are you talking to me? I'm not famous. Stop treating me like I'm famous. I'm just a guy on YouTube. Anyone can do it. Mm. It's, it's, <laughs> that's, stop treating me that way because I'm not. I'm just some dorky mathematician. I don't like being treated that way. Thank you. And that's not very, what's this word I'm trying to get to? Gracious. Thank you. That's not very gracious way of taking what they're doing. And that's... Absolutely true. So now, of course, I take that with better grace, which means if that happens, they come up to me. Now I have to switch into that persona, that presentational persona. I try to be welcoming and ask them who they are and what videos they like to watch. And, and we have that moment. They're looking for a moment with me. That's the frustrating thing, isn't it? I'm just going about my shopping or daily life and they see me and they want to have a moment with me. And that's the difficult bit giving that person a moment, which is I don't always do very well, but at least I try and take that graciously, yeah. Has it ever happened to you when you've been with your dad? No. That's the moment I want to see. Uh, it's just never happened with my dad or my parents, and I've never told them that I get recognised. I've never told them about it because I think they need to see it for themselves because they'll just say, yeah, sure. Okay. I believe you, James. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm sure you did. And I don't think they will appreciate the impact and how much the viewers love what we have created if they don't see it for themselves. They have no understanding, really, of what we do. So I'm afraid um, we'll have to wait for that moment. When you give talks and things like that, and you, obviously I imagine you have question time at the end of a lot of your talks, what question do you think people ask of you the most? Well, I prefer to keep things on topic. I don't want questions about myself, I'm afraid. I prefer not to have questions about myself. I'm sure you'd prefer it, but my question is what question are you, are you asked the most? Well, I tend to maybe arrange things so that I do get questions on topic. I rarely get questions about number file or myself, right? But it's increasingly true that the audience are people who know me from number file, which is actually a hindrance in some ways because it's a lot easier to talk to an audience who has no idea who you are and then to introduce yourself to that audience and win them over then to have some people in that audience know who you are and they go, this is James Grime from number five. Or ask you a really niche alienating question well, about Parker yeah. Squares or something and no uh, one yeah. yeah. knows what it is. Yeah. So I'm afraid I don't have a good answer for this because I don't tend to get number file or personal questions in my talks. Let me ask you one then. Yeah. 
What's your favorite number for a video you've made? Nice question. You must get asked that a lot. I have been asked that question. We've, where I've done events which are a bit more general. Yeah. When it's a bit more general, where I'm actually there as a presenter, as someone who does number files. So yeah, favorite number file video. Yes, I have been asked that. My favorites are the ones where I get to do something a bit meaty. Actually, some proper maths, a proper theorem, and explain it, and give you a, at least a good, a decent explanation of the proof within that 10-minute structure of a number file video. So I think some successful videos like that, Quaternions we did, I think that actually turned out quite nice. So I explained what it was nicely in that 10-minute kind of restriction. So Quaternions or the four-color theorem, yeah, you know, like proper maths, and also where I tackle the proper proof. Cool. Is that okay? How that's do you feel it's, about it's, that? It's, your, it's a personal decision. <laughs> Is there a topic or an, a video that you want to do on number file that you haven't done yet for some reason because you're too intimidated by it or you can't quite get it right? Have you got your white whale? Yeah, yeah. There's some that, that I have my list of ideas and they remain on my list of ideas and then there's some that are like that where maybe they're too much for me to take. I need to have some time to really learn that thing and then it turns out someone does it before me and then they always do a much better job than I would have done. And I watch them, I think, oh, that's wonderful. That's a wonderful video. I mean, we did Marcus de Sautoy, did Girdle, the Girdle incompleteness theorem. That was on my list of ideas. But also, I want before I do that video, I want to know it properly. I want to understand it properly before I then regurgitate that for the number file audience. Thankfully, Marcus, who knows this stuff already, can do that for me. He took that pain for me. And then sometimes I have a good idea and it gets I get scooped. You have to let me know, James. I'll always give you first bite. I always think they do a much better job than I would have done. So I, I much prefer that they did it. Is there any that's still on that list that I need to get to? You don't have to give them away now. I don't want you to give them to other people to scoop you. <laughs> well, then maybe I'll have to keep it a secret. One last thing. What's the next thing for you? Like, I hope you keep doing number five videos. I will keep begging you to do them. And I'm so grateful that you do. But like, do you have like... A next big step? Is there an end game? Do you want to present that BBC documentary? Mm. Do you want to do something different in a new mode of communication? Do you want to go back into mathematics more and actually maybe prove something, create a theorem? And I've considered all those things. I have considered going back into academia. Yes, I have considered that. But I think I'm, in, I'm doing what I do best. I'm using all my skills. Really, it's my dream job. I'm where I want to be. And it's where I was going anyway. It's where I was always going. All these influences have all joined up and combined to what I do now. So how could I beat what I do now? What could I do next? I mean, I if I was offered anything exciting, I will take anything exciting. And if I had the ability to do what I do now, but perhaps maybe not travel around so much, that would be less exhausting for me. I mean, I must be honest. I would be looking out for something where I can do more my communication of maths, talk to the public, and maybe stay still. That would be nice. To learn more about James, to watch his videos, all that sort of stuff, maybe even book him to speak at your school or organization or club, check out the links in the notes for this podcast. A good starting place is jamesgrime.com. Our thanks to James for joining us today and his ongoing dedication to number file videos. For supporting this podcast, I'd also like to thank the Mathematical Sciences Research Institute in Berkeley, California, and also in Berkeley, the audio engineering company Maya Sound, which when they heard we were starting a podcast, threw their support behind us. We're really appreciative to them as well. We'll be back again soon with another episode, but from me, Brady Harron, it's bye for now. <laughs>